that? Or can we just sort of dig in, continue the day that we started last time, and then you'll have time for homework? You guys okay? So let, let, me, let me say this differently. Were there any questions in the homework that you feel like if you don't get it clarified, you're not going to be okay to move forward? Okay, so guys, with that said then, grab the notes that you started last time. All right. So guys, by way of review, why don't we reconnect where we left off? So this was the conversation that we had last time. We talked about the idea that gases are very, very complicated, complex, and even chaotic systems. As a result, they're difficult to study. So in order to make up for the fact that they are complicated systems, as we do often in science, we draw on a simplified model. And instead of treating gases as if they, as, as they really are, we treat gases as if they were ideal. And so guys, when we talk about ideal gases, we are talking about samples of substances where the particles themselves have some really interesting behaviors. And guys, in ideal gases, we make two oversimplifications. So the first one we talk about is the idea that molecules in a gas have mass but no volume. Again, what does that mean? And that's the word, not quite the word, but guys, the word that we were looking for here is insignificant. And so probably even if we could draw this to scale, my circles are even inappropriate representations. It's really more like maybe this. So guys, inside a sample of a gas, the volume of the molecules themselves are insignificant compared to the overall volume. Um, why is that true? How then can a gas fill a balloon if the molecules are so small? They're moving around, and as we cool them down, they slow down, and if we could cool them down enough that they would stop moving at absolute zero, their volume falls to what? To zero. And that's why we use Kelvin temperatures to study gases, because it gives us a common zero point between temperature and volume. Anything there you need to talk about? Okay, so then guys, the other simplification that we make when we talk about ideal gases is they have no intermolecular forces. We understand that that is not exactly the case, that when these things hit, they actually do momentarily stick. But guys, in addition to that, these molecules actually do have very weak inward trending forces. The majority of the mass, the center of mass is in the middle of the balloon. And these things are actually being very weakly, but they are being drawn to the middle. What does that do to the gas? It decreases its pressure. Think about that. The intermolecular forces decrease the pressure of the gas because these molecules are being drawn together. You okay with that idea? Okay. So then, guys, from there, uh, we talked about the factors that influence the behaviors of gases. We said that we need standards for those things. Those things were standard temperature and standard pressure, which we abbreviate STP. Standard temperature is freezing for water, zero Celsius or 273 Kelvin, and you've got to be able to make that conversion. And then standard pressure is all of those units of which we will mostly use millimeters of mercury and ATM. You guys good? Anything you need to review? Okay. So guys, with that said, let me just tell you right now, gases are funky, funky, funky systems. Right when you think you understand them, you're going to find out that, that your understandings are actually not just a little, they're, they're wrong. 
because these things behave so differently simply because they're so spread out. We'll talk more about it over the coming days. But guys, today what we're going to do is we are going to introduce some fundamental understandings that you've got to understand about the relationship between temperature and pressure and specifically the volume of a gas. We're going to talk about Boyle's Law. We're going to talk about Charles' Law. Guys, these are very intuitive. You'll pick them up quickly. Then we're going to talk about what is called the Combined Gas Law, which brings those two together. And then, guys, finally, we're going to talk about ideal gases. And this is where this gets a little bit weird. You guys ready to go? Okay, here we go. So guys, starting with what is called Charles' Law. Scratch it down. All right. So guys, I'm just going to give this to you in a nutshell, and then we'll talk about the implications. But guys, you do need to have a functional understanding of the definition, which is this. Charles' law simply says that the volume of a gas at constant pressure varies indirect or directly with Kelvin temperature. It actually sounds better when you do it in an announcer voice. The volume of a gas at constant pressure varies directly with Kelvin temperature. Was that better? So guys, you ready for some earth-shaking information? You heat up a gas and it gets bigger, you cool down in a gas and it gets smaller. If you had figured that out 200 years ago, it would have been earth-shattering and it would have been named after you instead of after Lord Charles. But guys, it's really seriously that straightforward. You heat up a gas, it gets bigger, you cool down a gas and it gets smaller. But guys, here's the challenge. I wonder if I can erase these. I can't. So guys, here's the challenge. We're going to draw a lot of pictures in this unit. Guys, why would heating up this gas make it bigger? Go ahead. Okay, so keep going. So I totally agree with you that heat them up makes them go faster. But why would that make them get bigger? So what's keeping them from being big in this picture? The cylinder, right? Okay, so here, so hold on a second. Guys, you got to think through this with me. So let's look at one of two scenarios. And guys, these are, here's the, guys, you got to choke on the details that if you don't connect with the details in these logical ideas, you're going to miss the big ideas when they come. So guys, let's look at this in two different scenarios. Imagine that this is a rigid tank, like for example, uh, a propane tank or, a, or a, a can of gas. Imagine that it was this. So guys, if you were to heat up the gas, and that tank is rigid, it can't get bigger. So if the tank can't get bigger and you heat this up, what will happen to the gas? The pressure will go up, which guys is why this is important. It says at constant pressure, which is not this scenario. This would not be at constant pressure. If you heat this dude up, the pressure is going to go up. So what would have to be true of this container for the pressure to not go up? It's got to be flexible. It's got to be able to expand and contract like a balloon. So guys, now that we're talking about balloons, I don't even know if I should do this in COVID days, but here we go. Okay. So guys, now if we were to take this balloon and if we were to heat this up in such a way that we could do it without melting the balloon, what's going to happen to the balloon? 
It's going to get bigger. The pressure doesn't change. The size of the balloon changes. And we talked yesterday or last time conversely about the idea that if we were to take this outside and put it in a cold environment that it would shrink, right? So when that happens, the pressure doesn't change, which then brings us back to the conversation that we had before you guys get up and up and down and down. Guys, the conversation we had before about flat car tires, right? And Ronnie brought this up last time, and the idea is that on a cold day, your tires are flat because the pressure has actually gone down. The volume has decreased, and they, they flatten because the gas is moving less readily. Do you remember? And then, guys, similarly, this is also how hot air balloons work. But you're missing something. So guys, what does Charles Law tell us? And by the way, you need to know this law by name. Charles Law says that when we heat up a gas, what does the gas do? It expands. So why doesn't the hot air balloon blow up? Mm -mm. Not the bottom. There's a hole in the top. Guys, for those of you that don't understand this, in a hot air, have any of you been up in a hot air balloon? You've seen the hole. There's a hole in the top of a hot air balloon. And if you are the pilot of a hot air balloon, you've got two controls. You've got burner and you've got a, a thing, a rope that opens the flap. And so guys, when a hot air balloon pilot wants to go up, what they do is they ignite the burner and that puts heat up into this envelope of gas and these molecules accelerate and they want to spread out. But at the same time, you've got to open the hatch in the top and as these spread out, they go out the top. And as they go out the top, their density goes down and that's what makes the balloon float. Then once they've got the gas to the temperature they want, they close the opening and then that thing just continues to rise. But guys, understand if there were not an opening in the top of the balloon, the balloon would explode. You guys know this or did maybe, did, does that make sense? You get the idea? Okay. By the way, have any of you guys seen the movie The Argonauts? It's actually, um, it's an Amazon original movie. It's actually a great movie. It's about, um, well, it's, it's sort of a true but sort of engrandized story about some people back in the like 1800s that were actually using hot air balloons to get up like into our stratosphere. And it's actually, it's a, if you need a good watch, it's actually a really neat show. It's worth watching. It's called The Argonauts. Um, it's, it's kind of a neat movie. Um, okay, so you get the idea with Charles Law? Okay. So now, guys, let's jump over here and let's talk about Boyle's Law. Should I do the voice again? Okay, Boyle's Law says this. <clears throat> the volume of a gas at constant temperature varies inversely with pressure. Was that okay? It's all I got. So guys, the volume of a gas at constant temperature varies inversely with pressure. So you are, of course, similarly ready for the radical implications of this idea. If you squeeze a gas, it gets smaller. No, no, no. I know, this is science. We can talk about hard things. When you squeeze a gas, it gets smaller. And when you squeeze it less, it gets bigger. Of course, you'd like to see this in graphical form. When the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. When the pressure goes down, the volume goes up. Here's the problem, though, guys. You've got you got to understand that the pressure that we're talking about is the pressure on the inside and not the pressure on the outside. It's the opposite if you're talking about the pressure on the inside. So we are talking about the pressure that the gas is being exposed to. Is that okay? Okay. So guys, with that said, talk to me about the thinking behind this. This is not a hot air balloon. This is actually a weather balloon. 
this thing goes up not because of heat. This thing goes up because it's a big old envelope of helium gas. And guys, we can get these things high enough in our atmosphere that you can see the curvature of the earth. We're way up high. But guys, here's the thing. This balloon is ready to go. This balloon is fully inflated. Why do they send these balloons up half inflated? Pressure what? Where? Where? Yeah, and so... Exactly. So guys, the idea is this. You let this balloon go, and if you let this balloon go fully inflated, it would get up to ten or 15,000 feet, and up there the pressure is so much less that the gas inside would expand and the balloon would fail. So what they do is they send these balloons up partially inflated, and when they get up into our upper atmosphere, they have now expanded to the point at which they become neutrally buoyant, which is kind of a neat term, which simply means they don't rise or fall. And at that point, when they become neutrally buoyant, they hover, and they can actually figure out at what altitude these things will then start to hover simply by figuring out the volume of the fully inflated balloon and the amount of gas it takes to get Get it there at that altitude. Huh? Not bad. Pretty good science. Then, guys, this is, of course, the opposite of that. Um, so instead of going up in our atmosphere where the pressure is less, we can also talk about going down in another fluid. You understand that our atmosphere is a fluid. Well, so is water. And so, guys, if we have, by comparison's sake, and I can zoom into this, um, this is actually proportionally relative what happens to gases like balloons if we were to send it down into the water. So if you were to send a balloon down to a depth of 10 feet, guys, at 10 feet, you are now experiencing twice atmospheric pressure. So if you dive to the bottom of a 10-foot 10, 10 diving well, you are now being exposed to twice atmospheric pressure. And as a result, the balloon would literally cut in half. This is a linear relationship. If you double the pressure, you cut the volume in half. And you can see that you can just keep going as you go down and down and down. So the opposite is also true. If you increase the pressure, you decrease the volume. Do you get the idea? You guys good on, on Boyle's Law as well? And guys, again, you do need to know these by name. These are called Boyle's Law and Charles Law. And guys, not only do they work conceptually, but they also work mathematically. So guys, what we're going to talk about then is what is called the uh, combined gas law. Guys, you want to you wanna, uh, scratch this down? Well, you know what? You don't. We'll just write down the equation. So guys, we now know the two factors that determine how gases, how the volume of a gas can change. Those factors are pressure and temperature and sometimes both. So we can bring this together in what is called the combined gas law equation. Guys, write this dude down. P1 V1 over T1 is equal to P2 V2 T2. Sort of, but it's not directly related, and I want to talk about it in a second. And that's the difference. Yep, and we're going to get there in just a second. So guys, this is the idea. You need to understand what this equation is useful for, and you need to understand the, um, the, the, the units that you want to use to solve this equation. So guys, this is worth maybe scratching down. Spencer, here's the answer to your first question. This equation is only useful for change. So sometimes you will see this equation written like this. These will be I's for initial, and let me change colors. And these will be F's for final. Guys, this equation is only useful 
when you know the volume at one set of conditions and you want to know the volume at another set of conditions. So now let's talk about units. And guys, fundamentally the idea is this. It really doesn't matter tremendously what units you use. Pressure could be in ATMs, pressure could be in TOR, doesn't really matter because they're the same on both sides and therefore they're proportional, uh, so it doesn't matter. Volume can typically be in liters, could be in milliliters. Again, it doesn't really matter because they're proportional, but whatever your units are for your setup, that will be the units for your answer. Guys, temperature does matter. Temperature has got to be in Kelvin. And so if you're not in Kelvin, you've got to add 273. Then guys, the other thing that you need to know about this equation is if something's not changing, it factors out and therefore you can get rid of it. So for example, if you have a question that says something like three liters, you don't need to write this down, three liters of gas goes from a pressure of 250 tor to 600 tor, what's the new volume? You get the idea? Here's the question. Will the answer be greater or smaller than three liters? That you should be able to come up with like that. The volume will be greater or smaller than three liters? Smaller, because we're starting at 250 tor, we're going up to 600 tor, we're compressing, we're increasing the pressure, so the volume will get smaller. So then guys, the question is, how do we solve this? And we've got P1, V1, T1 over P2, V2, T2. So you'll notice guys that we've got pressures and we've got volumes. What about temperature? Because it's not mentioned, it's assumed to be unchanging and as a result, you can get rid of temperature and then you just simply be solving that. Pressure one would be 250, volume one is three liters. Pressure two would be 600, volume two would be your X. You get the idea? Okay, there you have it. So guys, that is the idea behind Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, and the combined gas law, which is this equation. Anything there you want to talk about? You okay? Okay. Guys, this is where this gets weird. We are now going to explore something called Avogadro's hypothesis. You definitely want to write this down. So, guys, obviously you've seen me do this, so you know that what I'm about to tell you is a lie. Yes, but for different reasons. All right, let's try this again. Okay. So guys, this is the way that I teach this to general chemistry, which you missed out on last year. But it's no less important that you understand the ideas. So guys, as I mentioned to you earlier, gases are very counterintuitive systems. I know that right now we're not really appreciating that, but we will in the coming days. But allow me to start 
um, developing this counterintuitive idea by establishing a thought. So guys, imagine, as it says, that we have a 30-gallon trash can like this one up here in the front of the room. Imagine it's empty. Now guys, imagine that we fill this trash can with tennis balls. So you grab a bunch of tennis balls and you fill up that trash can with tennis balls. Can you picture it? Okay. Now imagine that you empty the trash can and you now fill up the trash can with volleyballs. Here's the question. Which of these two ball types required more to fill the trash can? Tennis balls or volleyballs? Tennis balls. Why tennis balls? Because they're smaller. So we've established a hypothesis or a principle, ready, that says it takes more small things to fill a space than it does big things. Good? Okay. Now, guys, let's do this. Instead of tennis balls and volleyballs, let's talk about hydrogen and propane. Hydrogen is like unto our tennis ball. It is a small, simple molecule like so, diatomic. Guys, propane looks like this. Three, prop means three, ane means single bonded. It's a hydrocarbon and it looks like this. So this is propane. If you were in my general chemistry class, I would lie to you and tell you that these balloons were full of hydrogen and propane because none of my general chemistry students are intuitive enough to figure out that, that if this was full of hydrogen, it would float. So we'll leave it at that. So guys, here then is the question. We're going to pretend, you know it's not true, that this is full of hydrogen and this is full of propane. Here's what I'd like to do with you. So guys, we are going to allow, well here, we'll do it conceptually first and then we'll play with it. So guys, hydrogen and propane, you know that it's not true, but I'm going to ask you to please give me the benefit of the doubt that these balloons are the same size. I got as close as I could. So guys, hydrogen in this balloon, propane in this balloon. Here's the question. Which contains more molecules? Are there more hydrogen molecules in this or propane in this? Hydrogen? Why? Because we've established the principle, right? In the same way that it takes more tennis balls to fill this space than it would volleyballs, it makes intuitive sense that there's more hydrogen molecules in here than there are propane molecules in here, right? Most of you know that you're being led to the edge of a cliff. Guys, that is not the case. There are exactly the same number of molecules in here as there are in here. And that's not because you know that it's actually my exhaled breath. Guys, if this was hydrogen and if this was propane, it would be exactly the same number of molecules. Exactly. Guys, the reason is because these balloons do not fill the space because of their size in the first place. So guys, why do these balloons fill these spaces? Because they're moving. And guys, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, allow me to share with you this analogy. We're going to talk more about that in a couple days. So guys, this is the mental model that you need to have in your head. Huh, I don't know where it went. That's interesting. So guys, it goes like this. We're going to allow these ping pong balls to represent our propane molecules, and we're going to allow these airsoft pellets to represent our hydrogen molecules. Now guys, if gas molecules functioned like tennis balls and volleyballs, we would have this, right? If gas molecules functioned like tennis balls and volleyballs, then yes, we would have more hydrogen than we would propane because the hydrogen molecules are smaller. But guys, why is this not what it looks like inside of these balloons? 
Yeah, they're spread out. Guys, what phase does that represent inside these beakers? That's more like a liquid. So what does it look like inside of a gas? And guys, the answer is this. It is, oh no, somebody tore my parafilm. I'll bet I still have some out next door. This is what happens when you don't do this. y'all I'm struggling oh here we go so guys this is actually what it looks like inside of these gases this is why these molecules fill the spaces it has nothing to do with the size of the molecules themselves and everything to do with their volume and so consequently, when we slow these down, we can see that it takes two hydrogens to fill this and it takes two propanes to fill this because they don't fill the space based upon their volume anyway, Ethan, as you pointed out. Because they don't fill the space anyway because of their volume. They fill the space because of their movement. And seemingly small changes between like the size of this and the size of this do not matter. Consequently, if we've got two balloons with the same volume, these have exactly the same number of molecules in them. Do you get the idea? Guys, that is what is called Avogadro's hypothesis. So let's scratch it down. So guys, Avogadro's hypothesis says this. Or Ava, I'm sorry, Avogadro's principle. Says this, two similar gas samples will contain the same number of molecules because the molecules are not in contact, but rapidly moving objects. These molecules do not fill the space based upon their size. Remember the word we use, guys, is insignificant. They do not fill the space based upon their size. They fill the space based upon their movement. You guys okay? You good? Okay, so guys, I would encourage you to do this with me. The question now becomes, what does it mean to be similar? It says two similar gas samples. And guys, there's a very important counterintuitive thing going on here. So for us to understand it, we'd better understand what similar means. So if you find this helpful, which I do, I'm going to draw myself a couple balloons. And I'm going to call this one my hydrogen balloon. And I'm going to call this one my C3H8 propane balloon. And we're going to allow these, oh boy. Shoot. Um, hold on a second, guys. I hope you did a better job than me. Oh, I can't go back far enough. Should have been more careful. So as best as I can, still too big. <laughs> ah! The plight of, a, that's gonna have to do. All right, so which one was H2? Not that it matters, left or right, right? All right, so this is our C3H8, and this is our H2. But guys, you understand that these represent our balloons. So on your page, on my screen, are just representations of these two things. 
So guys, the question then becomes this, what is similar about these balloons given everything that we've talked about relative to gases? Same, Same what? Volume. Same volume. And you're gonna have to be a little generous with that, but we're gonna say their volumes are equal. We're gonna end with that. Guys, what else is the same about these two balloons? Same temperature. What will that temperature be? Room temperature. They're in the same room. They've been allowed to equilibrate. By the way, guys, how do we know that they're both at room temperature? Because if they weren't, what would they be doing? expanding or contracting as they reach room temperature. And we know that because we understand Boyle's law or Charles law. Charles law, Charles is temperature and pressure or temperature and volume. So guys, we know they're at their same temperatures. What else is the same? Same pressures. How do we know? Because they're in the same room and if they were equilibrating to the pressure around them, we would see their volume change. But now guys, and Spencer, this is your second question. We now know from understanding Avogadro's principle that there's something else that's the same. The number of molecules. Now, guys, you remember, I hope, learning about Avogadro previously. Because what do you know about Avogadro? Avogadro's number, which is the number of molecules or particles in a mole. Well, guys, the idea is this. Avogadro came up with his number by studying gases. So as he was doing this work on gases and their unique properties, he found it necessary to count molecules. And obviously he couldn't do that. So out of necessity, he developed his number as a way to allow him to quantify numbers of particles because that was necessary for his study of gases. He assigned a variable to these and it's simply N. And the unit for N is the mole. And the abbreviation for mole is MOL, which is the saddest abbreviation ever. Drop the E. But guys, this is it. So now, Spencer, here comes question number three. You ready, guys? Look at what we got. We've got pressure, we've got volume, we've got number of moles, and we've got temperature. And guys, as Avogadro was studying these things, not surprisingly, he found out that there was a relationship between these things, and he quantified them in an equation that is so important that one of my AP classes printed it on a hat. This is lovingly what is known as the Pivnert equation. And guys, it goes like this. You can call it Pivnert. It is actually what is called the ideal gas equation. Understand that this equation only works if gases are behaving ideally. If they are not behaving ideally, then we have to take into consideration the volume of the molecules themselves and their intermolecular forces, and these equations get ugly. But guys, the thing that's cool is we can solve Pivnert and the answers are actually pretty darn good. So let's talk about the variables. What do you suppose P is? Pressure. What are our units going to be? We're going to use atmospheres. Guys, why does it matter what units we use? Remember, it doesn't matter what units we use in the combined gas law equation. Why does it matter here? because of R, and we'll talk in a moment. So guys, um, V is volume, and we're going to be in liters. N is the number of moles, not surprisingly in moles. I know. Then guys, R. R is what is called the universal gas constant. Here's what happened. 
As Avogadro was studying these gases, he was measuring pressures and volumes. He was measuring numbers of moles and temperature. And what he found is that they were proportional. Taking the pressure times the volume, taking the number of moles times the temperature, he found that these two values, their, their products were proportional, but not equal. But they were always different by some constant value, and he called that value the universal gas constant. So guys, all the universal gas constant does is truly makes these equal including R, pressure times volume does equal number of moles times temperature. And guys, the value for the universal gas constant is 0 0.08206, and notice the units, liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And then guys, finally, temperature is T, and it's in Kelvin. So guys, before we wrap up today, first of all, where did the units for R come from? And guys, if you don't understand this, there are some fundamentals in science that you need to, to sort of connect with. So Pivner is this. How do we solve for R? Divide by NT. Now, P is pressure in atmospheres, V is volume in liters, N is moles, T is Kelvin temperature. That's where the units come from, is from solving for R. Does that sit okay? Okay. Now guys, here's the thing. We need to grab our AP equation sheets. And let's make sure nothing's changed. Pivnert. So guys, on the page four side of the AP equation sheet, you'll notice Pivnert up there at the top. And then down below, it gives you values for the gas constants. You'll notice that they've given us several. Um, the top one we don't need right now because it's in relation to joules. But the second one there, guys, is liter atmospheres mole Kelvin. You know the negative one is in the denominator. But you'll notice that they also gave us one that is liters tor mole Kelvin. It just has a different value for R. You guys good? Okay. So guys, those are the fundamentals that you need to understand about gases. Typically, it's at this point that we say, let's dig into homework, and then we sort of play that by ear. Because let's dig into homework and let's get this done. Here's why. The lab that we're going to do today directly follows everything that you just learned, like that. And guys, you are going to want to have the experience of solving these problems in homework because those things will carry into lab. So guys, we now have 25 minutes left, which is a pant load of time. So guys, your goal in the next 25 minutes is to get the portion of your homework done that you didn't get done before. This is not me asking, this is me telling. We're gonna get this done. Then guys, when we get back together for third period, you're going to need your AP equation sheets and you're gonna need your books. And we are actually going to go into lab today and we're gonna measure R. We're gonna figure out that it actually is 0 0.08206. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute. So guys, grab your books, grab your stuff. Let's get this homework done. That is all.